the Urban Bushland Council was delighted to have Professor Kingsley Dixon talk to members and supporters about the topic of prescribed burning and its impact on biodiversity. This talk was presented on Wednesday 22nd of July 2020 to an in-person audience and also made available by Zoom. This is part of the Zoom recording. I'd like to now introduce Kingsley Dixon. That prescribed burning is a necessary practice that we have to put on these landscapes. However, he said, not at the cost to the environment. The word biodiversity hadn't really been created at that point. And certainly they were very aware, of course, of the obvious health risks to humans from smoke. And he goes on for several paragraphs in that document. It's interesting that document also uh, had reflections from a number of groups from around Western Australia. It had the Kings Park um, information around some consolidation of burning from uh, 19 from the 1930s all, all the way through to the 1980s, and, and that was the, the point where that was published. And from that, one would have thought that we would have got some new and insightful directions about how science should set the direction for such an imposing process called prescribed burning. So this is our review piece. They're the lineup of uh, uh, speakers that we, we had, or, or writers in it. Um, it was um, a, a very interesting uh, paper to, to get um, published because straight away, um, a number of us came in for very strong and personal attacks, which is a very interesting um, reaction to what is actually science debate and parts of what we proposed were that there needs to be a reconsideration we weren't saying things were wrong we were just saying there needs to be reconsideration and it, it seems as though the polarized debate keeps being driven um, by the way this is a, a, a typical marginal burn of a prescribed burn that was being done um, Late last year down in the South Coast. So they're 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 right, they're intensive activities. And if you have a look on the left hand side, you can see this is not forest systems. So what we started in um, 1919 with Kessel in the forest has now migrated across all landscapes in Western Australia. We'll hear about that in a moment. So this is a, an, an image just to remind you of where we are at in Australia. This is a consolidation of all the fires in December. 2019. This is taken from a NASA satellite, and I'm, I apologise to the. I oh know. I think the Zoom people can see this because they've got yes, the copies. Yes. And it's you screen. can see the southeast corner is ablaze. That was the beginning of the two months of fires. But you can also see fires pervading across the continent. This, of course, uh, many of these um, uh, are, are lightning ignitions. Um, many of them, of course, um, uh, particularly all through the top end are all the now almost annual prescribed burning that occurs across the top end of uh, the continent. And notice here, you can see the extensive spinifex burning that's happening um, through parts of the Great Sandy Desert and the Southern Kimberley route. Now it's also interesting that, um, and this is a, a, a fascinating um, image, uh, January 3, and um, this was, um, a consolidation of a whole lot of satellite thermal data. And January 3rd was one of the hottest uh, days ever on record in climatic history for Australia. But Australia on that day got the record for the hottest continent on earth. That's the day eastern suburbs, uh, western suburbs of Sydney reached uh, temperatures of around 50 degrees C. That of course starts you can almost get spontaneous combustion at those sort of temperatures. But it shows one of the important features of this cotton that things are heating up and heating up in a dramatic way. So of course the fires raged um, through those terrible couple of months. And as I watched those fires and was being interviewed um, by uh, lots of uh, global news uh, broadcasters that are involved with threatened species conservation on the East Coast through my work with the federal department, it was very interesting to see the dialogue starting to arise about we need to burn more of the landscape and this, these fires were a direct result of the lack of prescribed burning, which of course is one of the ways that you punish nature for nature doing what nature has always done. 
And I picked this out of some of the sort of social media dialogue that was going on. This is a bloke that lives in a place in northern New South Wales, uh, Waitala, Waitaliba. And you can read that, but essentially in September, they had what they called the Tablelands Fire. All around that town, it had been intensively prescribed, but they said there's hardly a leaf on the ground. And in the Tablelands Fire, it swept through to what little understory there was. In January, they had nothing left to burn except the canopy. The canopy came through and killed two people in that town. And he said, as you can see, that no doubt people will start talking about hazard reduction and burning. That was a falsehood that led that town into a disastrous situation. Now, I'm a Waruna resident. I lived, I had the closest property to the ignition point of the 2016 Waruna Yalu fire. So I've, I've lived on a fire front. And for 36 hours, we pleaded with DFIS to please put out the fire that was 20 kilometers to our east in, in the state forest. And they were told it's too rugged to get implements in. And then when we suggested they bring in water bombers, we were told that they would be stationed at Perth because of an impending high fire danger later in the week. Little did they know the high fire danger was going to be a direct result of the fire of their ignorance to put the at source suppression of that fire out. We evacuated from our property. The wind shifted on the Thursday night. We were saved purely by a wind shift. Otherwise, we would have lost everything. So people say, what does he know about fire? I know a little bit about fire because I've lived through it and can understand where there are real deficiencies in some of the system. But I'm not going to talk about that today. So there's a Royal Commission now that's happening. The Royal Commission and, and noteworthy people, Kerry Stokes, uh, Twiggy Forrest, who I don't think has ever done anything in the bush, and, and Kerry Stokes, who I know well, I don't think he knows the bush at all. He was raised in Waruna for a while. Both have come out saying the whole country needs to now have a unified prescribed burning pro process because that's the only way we're going to save the country. And we have to be very worried about the Royal Commission and the focus that there is on, on this alone. Now, there's been a number of very significant submissions from the scientific community that shows that all of the fires, in fact, the areas that burnt in December and January, many of those areas have had, over the last 10 years, 10 times the prescribed burning that they would had in the previous 20 years but it didn't really make a difference. When you're at those temperatures of 50 degrees C, the best thing to do is to bunker down or evacuate because there's nothing much you can do. And as we found with the Yalu fire, that swept through a whole mosaic of different prescribed age burning areas. Ferguson ignored that and came up with the recommendation to reinforce what has now become the major issue that we face in the Southwest. Now, prescribed burning that we have, and I call it the 20th century prescribed burning, because it started in 1919 in Western Australia. We are the architects of what's considered the most elite and sophisticated prescribed burning policy on the planet. It's one that's lauded internationally as a model example of how you can suppress fires adequately through the use of this. And in fact, you almost don't need suppression systems when you've got fabulous prescribed burning. The interesting thing about this is that these people uh, through this process have developed a significant business. So it's around 53 to 54 million dollars a year is expended on burning uh, the landscapes of West Australia. It's not a small budget by any stretch of the imagination. Now one of the key issues is that it assumes that all the species, the animals and the plants and the ecosystems that we have will survive those prescribed burning regimes. Sadly, and you can read this while it's up here, but sadly, we are one of seven countries responsible for half of the biodiversity extinctions on the planet. So our past record doesn't put us in good stead for the future record. A lot of these were caused by the um, errant introduction of a range of feral animals, we understand that, but we now see that what little we have left of the continent, 48% of the continental land mass is now degraded 
by human act our human activities, not Aboriginal activities. It means that we have mere fragments of this continental biodiversity that remains. It means whatever we do on these landscapes that's large scale needs to be scientifically validated that we're not going to hit species and ecosystems down the pathway of increasing what is essentially a major uh, <laughs> problem. Now, our Noongar and, uh, co and uh, colleagues and uh, people of the Wadjuk Nation see this so clearly. This is Leslie Schultz. He's a Nadju elder. They're the people from the Esperance and South Coast region that have uh, now rediscovered their land and, and the Great Western Woodlands is, is the heart of, of their country. He made a comment last year, we are the kings of extinction. He's referring to all people that live today, that Western Australia in particular is one of those places. And why is that? Well, you've seen this image before. This is up, up at Mount Benia which is right next door to Mount Lesur, fabulous area. Uh, it's in the custodial ship of UWA, great on UWA. Christine is ex-UWA, she's <laughs> never been there. It's the most extraordinary place to go, uh, to go and visit. Um, and if you go to those sorts of areas and put these quadrats in, and I've used this before, you'll get about 110 flowering species. So essentially, it's an extraordinarily rich country. Almost everything that you see here is found only in that region and nowhere else, except for things like the Kingia, which occurs right through the southwest. But that has its own story. You're looking at a living dinosaur of a plant that has lived on this landscape for around 120 million years. That's the date that we have <coughs> of the earliest evidence of this group. Flowering plants are 135 million years old. So just a whisper after the first flowering plants started opening their blossom, these wonderful things came into existence and only in Western Australia. It's in fact, they're in their own family, the Dasypogonaceae, and they're in their own order, the Dasypogonaceae. That is why we live in a remarkable place that is extraordinary and why we need to understand before we impose on these landscapes, before we lose this landscape, what we now, how does this look? Well, prescribed burning, and these are images that I took last spring, is now a colossal impact on our landscapes. The top left, as I was driving back from Maroona on a Sunday afternoon, that's Moore River National Park in the distance. We talked about the Swan Coastal Plain. You look at that impact, that is significant in spring. If you look at the Mount Lindsay fire, November last year, what a, what a catastrophic impact. Ring burnt and then aerial incendiaries at 100 meter intersections and they keep gridding the system until they get full ignition within a few hours. We just don't know what the impacts on, on the fauna are. This is me flying back in September into Western Australia. Can be quite depressing as a botanist. This is Mundaring, same system as you see in Mount Lindsay. This is Jared Island in the distance. This year alone, we saw one of the largest fires ignited near Collie, 56,000 hectares was taken out just north of Collie. These are colossal areas. And if you look along this plot here, this is from 1970 up to 2020, and sorry, it'll be a little small for the people at the back. This is the area of prescribed burn in Western Australia, and you can see where we're heading massive increases on landscapes. Now, a lot of this increase here is the large scale burning that's now happening in the savannah lands through the north. They just ignited just over a million hectares in the Great Sandy Desert. Again, using ring burning and then aerial incendiaries. This is not traditional burning by any stretch of the imagination. And I know uh, the Matu in that area are now concerned as the Nadju are in the Great Western Woodlands, which have had their first prescribed burning by the same sort of system. That is, the Nadju have said, we did not light this country up from helicopters. We walked the country with sensitivity and we were nuanced in what we did and there were areas we never burnt. So what does it look like today? This is um, a typical map of where prescribed burning was happening 
um, over uh, this winter period or the autumn period. So it's from Kalbarri in the north, they're now moving into the wilderness area towards the World Heritage Area up there. It's uh, some of the wheat belt reserves, it extends all the way out here. Um, it picks up, um, they hadn't picked up the Great Western Woodlands here, but you can see it pervades vast areas of the landscape. And you might say, well, yeah, there's big icons there, but when you look at the fact that four and a half million hectares was burned in the 2018-19 year. That's from the DBCA annual report. The newest annual report is due out any day now. These are these are very large areas indeed. Remembering in the southwest, we're uncertain of the total hectares, but we do know in the forest region they aim to burn 200,000 hectares of forest systems per annum, and it's considered successful if they exceed that. So why does this matter? Because this is all we have left. All the stuff that's light green is the stuff that's now gone. All the dark green areas are the little fragments, the highly fragmented, the highly um, uh, invaded areas that we've left in the southwest. Here's the Stirling Range National Park, which we're going to look at in just a minute. These are the forest systems. And of course, this is the Swamp Coastal Plain. There's the Moore River National Park sitting north of us there, which is our largest, most intact Banksia woodland remnant. This is what the, the plan looks like for the burning within that region. So these are the particular age structures that they aim for, and the new prescribed burning strategy is to aim for fuel ages of six years or less across those landscapes. It's less than six years, it's not even six years, it's less than six years. Yep, I'm being generous. <laughs> but what it says to you, again, remember what I, what I said at the beginning, it states that uh, biodiversity must be adapted to that regime. If it's mm -hmm. not adapted to that regime, it exits the system. So it says there is a one size fits all. So most thinkers will see that, uh, that as a significant issue. Now, um, part of my other roles is sitting on the Federal Threatened Species Scientific Committee. This is from one of our summary plots. And it's really worrying. The percentage of listed species along this axis, these are threatened species, critically endangered, vulnerable species. We have invasive species up here as one of the major threats, but we have fire and fire suppression activities as the second greatest threat. To the great credit of the Federal Department, we are now in the final stages of creating um, uh, altered fire regimes as a key threatening process. And it will talk about the way altered fire regimes are a major impact. And it came from the fact that we realised out of all the listings that we did, this was the big one. Agriculture sits there, that's already done, done the damage on the landscapes, but fire is the thing that's getting into those last remaining landscapes. And we see that playing out in many different ways. One of the issues in, in the use of uh, prescribed burning is the fact that you, you need to ensure that you don't get fire escapes. I cast your mind back to 2018. This is May 2018. This is the fire burn map for the Stirling Range National Park. This was the, the prescribed burn that got out of control and swept over and swept over the peaks. That's uh, from the West Australian. And this was the, the moment when the scientific community of Western Australia finally banded together. The Stirling Ranges is, is an important area because it is the absolute jewel in the Southwest biodiversity hotspot. It aggregates more species per hectare than almost any other area. It's our only area of montane vegetation. It's all we've got of anything that comes close to a semi-alpine system. Sadly, most of that has now been altered because of the way that we, white people, have been managing the Stirling Range. And the use of prescribed burning on this scale, which then overlays mosaics of different age burning, has caused major problems. Now, if you'd like to go to the conversation, July 8th, um, I wrote a piece. I wrote about the mountain bells. I'm a mad keen native plant gardener and I collect 
our Darwinias. And uh, they asked me what were the impacts of the fires in Western Australia. And so I wrote a piece about the mountain bells. We're uncertain whether Darwinia uh, colina and Darwinia macrostigia that you see here, the Mondurup bell, um, are still in existence following the fires that occurred this year um, because they were following hot on the tail of a series of prescribed burns and prescribed burns that went out of control. So we were getting fire frequencies beyond the 15 to 20 year fire frequency that species such as these were impacted. In fact, after that 2018 fire, the DBCA office in Albany listed the fact that there were seven threatened insects, 16 threatened plants and 10 critically endangered that had been directly impacted by that escape fire. Importantly, our only montane heath environment, this amazing system that sits up on the top of Bluff Knoll, the critically endangered one looked as though it was completely impacted. We're now at the stage of reassessing whether in fact that ecological community will be the first one in Western Australia to be classified as an extinct ecological community because of the radical alteration from repeated burning. So then we locked to the Stirling fire that happened this year. That then overlaid much of the parts of that system that had gone through the 2018 fire that then reburnt again. I guess I uh, looked at the, the burning, 17,000 hectares of the park that went up, so a third of the park went up. Um, it went right across a whole round of mosaics, but I was more shocked that as the fire was being brought under control, they brought in the military arm of DBCA. This is the largest backburn in the history of the Stirling Range National Park. It was interesting that colleagues from the Hopetown Fire, uh, fire Volunteer Group said they overheard the helicopter pilot as he was loading up with the incendiaries and, and remember, this is, a, this, is a, this is an area of world-class biodiversity. As he started up, he said, let's go light a barbecue. That is no way that we treat one of the greatest <coughs> biological jewels in the state. I guess as a scientist, it's hard to keep the science divorced from the emotion when you see that sort of impact. Again, the policy is you ring burn and then you aerial grid the area to try and get what I call pyrocumulus, to get the whole system going up into a central cloud. By that way, you prevent the escapes from occurring. Of course, for animals, I'm not a born specialist, uh, the opportunities for animals to escape the system is remote. So what did our review find, just so that you get a sense of the science behind this? What we found, and, and I'll put it there, one size does not fit all in prescribed burning. With a complex of well over 200 different ecological community types just in the southwest, we found that you cannot simply put one prescribed burning regime. Although we summarise this for all the Mediterranean regions, only in this Mediterranean region do we have such a high level of burning. For the southwest, it's the target driven, particularly in the forest, of 2,000 hectares, six year fuel ages or less that drive the system. We know that frequency is now, and I'll present the data in a moment, about 10 times the natural frequencies that would have occurred in the evolutionary history of these organisms. So that's what they adapted to, something at a much longer frequency, so up to 10 times. For many species, long unburnt areas are essential. And they're not actually areas that are full of fuel. They're uh, areas that often then go through major degradation processes and become, as um, John Septimus Rowe wrote, you could ride through the country because it was a parkland. Now, these areas that weren't intensively prescribed burned, these are the forest systems. Importantly, we talk about the drying climate and we talked briefly about review works that were coming out showing that the protective value of prescribed burning now needed to be critically examined. There is only one paper, a 2009 paper, that was done uh, by DBCA uh, in collaboration with UWA scientists, which looked at the protective value of prescribed burning. It showed there was some protective value, 
but the issue is the frequency that you need to do it, there are consequences. And those consequences are a little like this. Let's take this species for example. So this is, um, used to be called Dryandra sessilis, parrot bush, Banksia sessilis now. Carnabies love it, the birds love it. It's an interesting species because although it flowers freely three to four years after germinating, and you think, well, there you go, it's going to produce uh, seeds. It only sets seed at eight years. So remember, fuel ages, clonk, it's gone out of the system. Importantly, and I'm a beekeeper, it only gets to maximum nectar production, which equates to maximum floral production, which equates to maximum seed production for things like cannabis, at between 12 and 15 years. Much longer periods of time that we can't impose on these landscapes. And for my, my honey mates, they know exactly that, and this is the, the honey um, production uh, figures for Western Australia up there. So really big issue for those. But if we look at a range of other species, these are all, and uh, you can see the citations over here, 20 to 30 years, 15 years for native heaths and sedges. So these are the fire sensitive Restinaceae, Cyperaceae, and these are the Ericaceae here. All, all published work that, that pointed to these, these longer figures than we currently have. The work done by Don and Felicity Bradshaw, published in 2017 on honey possums, shows that the Pisces fire recovery period for honey possums, which are one of our key pollinators of many of our Myrtaceae and Proteaceae in the southwest, if you have one fire and then another fire six years after that, so the six year fuel age, you then need a 26 year period fire free to build up back to that recovery level. So if you keep burning for six years, you know that that animal will vanish out of that system. The Mardu, it's common in 40 year unburnt forest. And it's really interesting, Pear Christensen, who was a former calm person before he retired, wrote in 1975, because he was already seeing prescribed burning, that the Mardu was rare in regularly prescribed burned areas. He was in fact one of the people doing the prescribed burning, but they could see they were already altering the faunal structure by this impact. And data that we've just got from the Western ringtail possum, and I apologize to my Noongar colleagues, I struggled to say the Noongar word, Noongar, <laughs> um, but for it to be sustained with its foraging behaviour and it forages on a range of things other than peppermint, it's around a 20 year fire free interval that's necessary for those ones. We then have the data published from DBCA themselves in 2012, which was done up in the northern Bankshire woodland, showing less than five 16 year fire free intervals will reduce most of your reptile fauna in the system. What they didn't look at, of course, is the season at which you burn in those systems, which would have caused even more major impacts, in particular if the animals are active. And then we go down to splendid wrens, um, 12 years post fire, not in winter and spring, are uh, critical for those. It's interesting, in the 1960s, um, Harry Recker wrote that the splendid wren has gone extinct because of a very large wildfire. But as I'll present to you in a moment, preceded by intensive rotational burning through the quarter of the park um, on three to five year rotations. That had already taken that species to the brink and then one large fire finished that off. So that's vanished from King's Park and um, they've tried to reintroduce it unsuccessfully. So once these things have gone from the system, you don't necessarily get them straight back. Now this is um, from Neil Burrows who is a person known to many, many of you. He's the, one of the fire scientists, uh, now retired from DBCA. And this was one of his plots that uh, they had in one of their internal documents. Um, and it's the idealized relationship between time since fire and recovery periods. It's interesting, if you look at the Western Grey kangaroo and the, and the brush wallaby, two species that can bounce back into an area and eat all the green pit, their numbers can be really high and as the system matures and closes, they start to vanish from the system because they go somewhere else. But have a look at all of the other different animals that we've got here. Quokkas, Tamars, Mardus and Quenda, brush tails and ringtail possum. 
And if we put our six year fuel age into that, you can see you'll get some, but you certainly won't get all, and potentially you begin disabling the recovery period in that system. Now, if you're then overlaying this, as Mary has alluded to, the urban context, and let's face it, Western Australians are moving into more urban area, making most of Western Australia urban, because we are everywhere. Grass weeds become important. Now, this is an image I took in Kew last year. They had a big display in the main palm house, you know, the fabulous glass house. It was about fire on the planet, um, and that it's becoming a pervasive element, a human-induced fire, not, not natural fire. And they talked about the fact that there's this cycle, fire invasives, that drives the, the fire cycle. And I thought, isn't this amusing? The British have got it, but we don't seem to get it here. So in Kings Park, we published a piece of work in 2008, which was based on some wonderful maps that we were able to find from 1939. A wonderful, in fact, West Australia's first female botanist botanical lecturer at UWA, Alison Baird. For those of you who are, who are of a certain age, you remember Baird's was the, the predecessor of Myers in the city, and she was the heiress to the Baird fortune, but she, she was a botanist, and her place where she did most of her research was in Kings Park. And in 1939, she mapped a significant portion of Kings Park, an area around here, and they mapped as, and she was very early at college, she mapped all the shrubs and trees over a certain stem diameter. And then the maps were folded up and put away. And we found them in 1999. And so we were actually able to go back to her precise transects and replot those. So we were able to get this time capsule information about what's happened to the bushland. And what we found in 1939, she found that banksias were there, other trees were there. But look, isn't it great? In 1999, the number of trees had skyrocketed. But the devil is in the detail. What had actually occurred was banksias had gone from 55% of the cover value to 22% and they had been replaced by she oaks and rapid growing uh, wattles. Very different species that weren't providing the uh, ecological services that you get from banksias. In fact, what we had done from this period to that period is that we had converted it into a, a um, rapid regrowth system devoid of the key framework species. Now, Carnabies used to visit Kings Park bushland en masse because we have the early records, but with the depletion of Banksham and Zuzii, they no longer do that on those numbers. So, for example, she found in the southwest of the park that Banksia elicifolia, the holly leaf Banksia, was one of the most common species, and that's now reduced to just one plant in Kings Park. Banksia menziesii is likely to be extinct without significant intervention, probably within the next 20 years, we would expect, because there's no new natural recruitment happening. And why did this all happen? It all happened because, and we wrote this very cryptically in the paper because we were coming from writing this from a government department, we knew that it was the intensive prescribed burning that had been put over the park from, from uh, the early uh, 19. So uh, 19, from 1962, for example, they had three year rotations for a period from 1944 up to that period, they had up to a quarter of the park being burned. And it was very clear that you could radically alter the system. Now, Alison Baird also wrote a paper um, in uh, the 1970s where she said, all of these species can survive fire. They might survive, but they don't regenerate into that system. But we subsequently found through our work that we were missing key species from the system that we could no longer find. These were all the native heaths and all of the things that are killed by fire that come back from the soil, sea bank, not the legumes. These are all the really nice, rich things, winter flowering things, for example, uh, like the hibertias. They had vanished from the Kings Park system yet. Template sites that we used further north that match the same soil types, we could find those in those systems. And we had a surrogate for the impact of fire. 
It's felt grass, the introduced weed. This is it in 1939. We knew where it was. This is it in 1945. This is it in 1987. It moves only through the hand of man and the agency of fire. It doesn't move by itself in the tap bush. So that's our surrogate for what we were doing to that piece of bush. That's what happens if you start interfering with fire cycles and systems without having the proper science and the proper knowledge. This is what Kings Park bushland should look like in many parts. This is a template site that we had um, down in Jandicott Regional Park where I uh, currently have uh, research plots. This is what we've turned it into a she oak dominated grassy savanna that is highly flammable. Importantly, and this is from the, um, uh, the 2009-10 drought test in Kings Park bushland, we now have longer post-fire recovery periods in all species from the soil seed bank and we have the risks of recovery failure because of drying climates. Have a look at this, this is just off May Drive at what's happening to that piece of bushland. So it had altered from a Bankshire woodland to a she-oak, marry, wattle dominated system which was then maladapted to the climate change and so the system was had reached its uh, so-called tipping point. It had moved into a new, st a new state. Now, it's, the, the data is quite clear. There are alternatives that we've been exploring. I've uh, got a PhD student who's a very smart student who submitted his PhD today. And um, we've actually been working on how can you predict honey harvest from marry trees. And he's developed a tool where we can use high resolution new satellite imagery to map the point at which flower buds begin to get initiated on the Mary trees. We're doing it now with Jarrah. And so we can predict in November what your honey harvest is going to be three months later. So it's a very powerful tool. At the same time, he started talking to me about prescribed burning. I said, so does that imagery also work for prescribed burning? Could you find a fine? He said, oh yes, the new Japanese uh, Himawari monitor satellite is fantastic. Here's a prescribed burn down here. You can see the smoke here. All these little red dots that you see here are farmers burning off their stubble. We can go down to square meters and we can get it every 10 minutes. You can actually pick up the thermal signature of an ignition almost instantly. And what we've said in that paper, and we stand by it, rapid detection and at source suppression has to be a fundamental investment strategy to protect people. Waruna taught us that, but we still don't have that capacity. Indeed, it's interesting, I went digging. In 2016, the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, a federally funded centre in Canberra, recommended that with a drying climate and hotter conditions, we would have more catastrophic fires, and they recommended that there needs to be a major new airborne capacity for rapid detection and at source suppression of fires. 145 aircraft, not acted upon. And of course, we then had the rollout of the tragic fires. We now have a Royal Commission, and will one would hope that we will see some of this come out of the Royal Commission. I would seriously hope so. If we don't get this right, and I will end here, our actions today determine the biodiversity of tomorrow. This is uh, Warragup Springs Nature Reserve. It's a completely landlocked reserve in urban Mandra. It has the estuary on one side, full urban development on the other side. My sister is a fauna relocator. Warragup Springs was her primary site for taking Western ringtail possums from uh, the endless urban development that was happening, and she thought she had them in a safe location. She put 22 animals into that reserve over a five year period. 17 were deliberately burnt despite her protestations that they had a nationally threatened animal in there. She went in there to see one of her girls, which had, of course, died a terrible death. 
there are consequences for what we do on these landscapes. And within urban context, we have to be prepared to think differently and not let the fear that seems to pervade, particularly in the urban context, um, drive what will become, I think, a, an, an undesirable outcome for all Western Australians going into the future. Thank you. Our actions today determine the biodiversity of tomorrow. Thank you, Kingsley, for a very interesting and informative talk.